John Graham Paul, and I'm uh, I'm uh, here as in my capacity as a retired physician, a pediatric and uh, and adult oncologist. I worked as a professor down in the sunny south of Florida, University of Florida, for many years, and uh, um, have been interested in all aspects of um, the experience of having cancer. What led me to work with ch children and adults with cancer? I've realized this in recent years, though I didn't at the time uh, of my setting out on that path. But my mother died of cancer when I was 12, and um, I knew from then on, but more or less unconsciously, that that's what I had to devote my work to. I'm going to read a poem that is a requiem to my mother, who died when I was 12, and who inspired me, little to my knowledge at the time, to my work as an oncologist, and really to my work as a children's doctor. It's a sad poem, but it uh, hopefully captures something of what really, I look back now, more than 60 years to those days, and really what moved me to my life's work. No goodbyes were said. March 1948, I bore a lop-eared book tower beside you a mile on resolute six-year-old feet. Up Montpelier, look left, right, left, wary eyes on Ellis Park's wasp nests, pausing for the first sight of craggy Cotswold limestone, our new home. You in the upstairs front veranda overhanging the hydrangeas, peonies, hollyhocks, I, youngest, next to door, eking delicious moments of you, sneak peeks at your 1940s corset and knickers as you changed for a date with Buster at the hole in the wall. That's a problem. The Saturday bus ride to the high street, sans Bossy Mary and Namby Pamby Jane, toting each our unraveling canvas bags to butcher, grocer, fishmonger, cobbler, staggering at last to the sweet shop for polos and precious Sunday stock of Cadbury's. That night we sang the skyboat song, Loch Lomond, your crimson fingertips magically sweeping the keys. Did you, deeper enchantment, tiptoe after lights on my feigned sleep to brush my forehead with your soft breath and auburn hair? At St. Peter's for sports day in royal blue silk, you greeted mothers, fathers, shy bachelor masters as you watched my look at me mum moments, bearing off those glittery cups that grace my sideboard beside your punctured silver thimbles. March 1952, we four tramped Kimberley Woods, hoisted you fast failing across root hazards that braced the overarching oaks, and on to a last hospital visit in the rain. Two decades later, I forgave myself a morning surliness. Why is art important to the care of the ill, particularly the severely ill, seriously ill perhaps died? Um, and now we're really moving into the, the realm of the arts, at least I, I think so. And uh, I will tell you that um, it's been 25 years since, so about halfway through my career, I became interested in art as a, as a healing force. And by art, I mean, you know, the visual arts, the, I mean, photography, for, for sure. Um, 
musical music and of course we have a music therapist right here at this hospital St. Martha's who is doing a wonderful job the literary arts writing um, and the, the performance arts and drama and dance and so forth now all of these things but everything also like the art of eating uh, <laughs> cooking and all these sort of things this is all I, I believe absolutely and I became to became, came to realize um, about halfway through my career that th there was something missing in what I was doing. I was delighted to see the results of the kind of scientific approach to treating a patient. That was wonderful and there's no doubt about its success. But there was something missing and, and whilst I was beginning to get aware of the, the, the art of care as we've described, as we've talked about, um, it was interesting, it came to me that the art of care and the arts, it's no, it's no coincidence that we use the same words, art as a, 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 a the, the creative expression, which is common to every human uh, society and has been, anthropologists have shown that, that every human society ever has always um, fostered arts in its, in its midst. Um, and in, in all but, but the most recent Western, as they say, Western modern societies, it's been recognized as a healing force, a healing power. It's been crucial, you know, music and dance and storytelling and so forth. So I, that it came to me. I, I, it came to me in an indirect way, as so often things do, um, because I found myself writing um, poems, actually, uh, about my work, because it was hard, you know, looking, caring for children at that time, I'm going back to the late 70s and early 80s. Again, most of my patients were still not making it. We're dying, we're dying. And so, you know, this is hard. And I began to write about uh, those young people um, increasingly and thinking um, about how I was dealing with it. It was just helpful to me. How was I dealing with it? Um, and so, um, and, and, and what was the effect on my health? So I was doing, it for myself, and then I began to realize, well, this, 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 we need to, we need to explore this, and so I started bringing artists. That's what I did. We, we opened the door to the hospital and started bringing artists into the hospital, and artists of all kinds: poets, musicians, writers, um, uh, dancers. We have a, we've had a, a dancer in the hospital where I worked for about 20 years, and she is now a leading force, and this is down in the US, in the movement toward bringing arts into the system of health care that we have, both in this country, in the US, and elsewhere. Um, so I, it's just, to me, it's and the evidence that making art or enjoying art in all its forms is good for your body, your mind, and your spirit is overwhelming. It's an, an huge, and every artist should be recognized for what they're doing for the health of our society. Are they recognized? No, <laughs> certainly not. And we know that, but that's a whole another issue perhaps. <laughs> yeah, well I did start writing poetry and, and uh, I had fun with that. I, I, used to, I used to write rather heavy poems because I, I was uh, uh, heavy, but then I began to try to make it more to lighter. And one of the things they say about children, the reason that, the reason that children can fly like angels is because they take themselves lightly. And I began to realize that children did not, and indeed adolescents, I mean young people, didn't want to have solemn doctors around. They wanted, they didn't, it didn't help, it doesn't help. You know, my friend Patch Adams says, show me the evidence that solemnity ever cured anything. I was inspired by an eight-year-old boy, Joey, who had come a long, long way from Tennessee to see me down in Florida where I worked as a pediatric cancer specialist and uh, it came a time when it was clear he was going to die and that he would be best to go back home to Tennessee. Well, his mother said to me when I said, oh, we really don't think, he's eight years old, I don't think I can exactly tell him what's going to happen. She said, you must square with him, he's a brave boy, he needs to know. So. I guess that's what I had to do. I had to tell eight-year-old Joey what was going to happen to him. Candor. 
At eight years old, the cancer running rampage. Joe perches on my office sofa edge, thigh to thigh with mum, who has enjoined me square with him. But I beat about the bush a bit, then come at last to it. Joey, you're going to die, go to heaven. Words lost in his howl, like a wolf's, the hurling of his body into the yellow print dresses recesses. Three minutes at least of this, this keening as we eye each other, panicked. Whatever else was right to do, this wasn't it. But then, as instantly, on a long drawn in breath's end, he stops, swivels out, flicks a look, spots tears on cheeks of mum, dad, nurse, me, and determines he's grieved enough. It's time to lighten up, knowing me at other times a joker, a wearer of odd socks, funny noses. He spies memos, charts, photocopies, journals, jetsam of an urgent life, bespattering my carpet, and becomes the stand-up comic, offers his own joke. Didn't your mum teach you to pick up after yourself? He says, eight-year-old Joey makes a joke. He cries, he keens, he howls like a wolf for three minutes, and then he decides, I gotta pick these people up. I've caused, caused a lot of sadness, so I'm going to pick them up with a joke. And that's what it was, a joke about my littered office. Didn't your mum teach you to pick up after yourself? And yes, I do believe that uh, although I grieve for my patients, and I know every doctor, probably every nurse, uh, has grieved, perhaps not to the fundamental ex the degree that a family member, but the fact is that grief is good to express, and we should and need to, but I don't think it's terribly helpful to express it in the midst of um, being with a patient, a dying patient, for example. Generally, I would say that's not helpful to the patient because then the patient ends up having to take care of you. <laughs> like that little boy is essentially taking care of us. He was. Um, but I'm not sure that that's, there's a... I do believe we can put our feelings on hold. I don't think we have to be sad or angry or, or whatever um, right there on the moment, in that moment. I think we can take it and then express it. We shouldn't store it up. I think we should express it, but we could probably express it to our family members or to somebody, or to each other, our colleagues. That would be the best thing. Sadly lacking, unfortunately, in many um, health environments. A young woman um, of about, uh, she was 15 or 16, um, had been coming in and out of the hospital. She had terrible, uh, terrible pain. Uh, she'd had a cancer involving the spine. And um, so she was uh, almost in constant pain, but she had to be admitted a great number of times. Um, and uh, the young doctors, the resident doctors, would always just start an intravenous infusion and fill her up with morphine, fill her up, and they would drug her, essentially put her to sleep. And then she'd recover to the extent that she could go home again, but it would be like she'd just be essentially out of it completely. But really, it, it didn't benefit her very much. It just, you know, the, again, it's a very difficult issue, but how opiates, how morphine and the similar drugs work, um, but sometimes they can just have almost negative effects. It just didn't. It had all kinds of side effects for her and it really didn't help. But one day I went in to see her and she had her headphones in and um, I said, you, I'm sitting on a bed, what are you listening to? And actually she was listening to Mozart. And then, and what's more, she was moving, she was down, she was moving in her bed and it was like this. And I said, well, how does it make you feel? She said, well, I, you know, I wish they wouldn't give me so many of those drugs because I, I, I keep feeling, you know, I'm just, I can't, I'm all drove, doped out all the time. I don't think it helps. So um, I said, all right, well, I tell you what, I have a dancer and I'll have her. And I called my friend Joel and I said, um, would you come up and see her? And her? Her name was Erica. I'll call her Erica. And she um, said, Joel, and I said, bring some music. Um, 
maybe some classical music. Okay. So she just said, this time she bought some Beethoven. I said, now, Erica, do you know any Beethoven? Oh, I don't think so. But, uh, so I said, well, we're going to try some more. Anyway, make a long story short, it was actually due for her next dose of this morphine infusion, or more, that it was being given on a regular basis. And she said, I, don't give me any more of that stuff. I want to stay awake a little bit. So, indeed, we, we, Jill came out and she had these wonderful scarves. She'd dance with scarves around a patient's bed. It was quite wonderful to watch. And anyway, and she had scarves for Erica. And then they both, she was listening to the music, but this, she didn't put the headphones on, we just played the music so we could all hear it. And we all kind of started dancing a little bit. But she, anyway, Erica kind of was waking up. She was sitting up. And then after a while, she got out of her bed. She started dancing. So there's Jill and Erica dancing, and all of us doing a little, little dancing. And uh, the nurse was there. We were all having a little movement. And singing and the music is, I don't know whether it was one of Beethoven's symphony. Um, we're all listening and it's, anyway, to make a long story short, we discovered that this combination of music and dance was far more effective for this young woman's undoubtedly very real and power, extreme and chronic pain than all the morphine in the world. I, you know, and the resident doctors, could not believe it. We'd say to her, do, when, when they, she had to come back into the hospital, we said, just hang on, don't immediately hang, write her up for all this. What does this bring? Bring the musician back, bring the, the art, the dancer back, and let's just, because she always, you know, you need somebody else to help you get, get going. And so um, uh, that was perhaps the most powerful example I ever saw of someone who was completely transformed by the effects of art. In, uh, it, in clearly distinguished from the physical effects of a powerful analgesia, a pain medication. So that's one good story. I, uh, <laughs>